If chemistry is a game of electrons, then one of the most important things about atoms, about elements, is how easy or how difficult is it to pull electrons off of these atoms. The property that describes that ease or that difficulty of pulling off electrons is what is called first ionization energy. And here pictured at the top left of each cell in bold are the first ionization energies of the first uh, 20 elements. In this video, we're going to understand what these numbers mean and what they can tell us about the properties and behavior of these elements. So let's get started. Our formal objectives are the following. We'd like to be able to define the term first ionization energy and also give the equation for it. Secondly, we'd like to be able to identify and explain the trends in first ionization energy down a group and also across a period, specifically just periods two and three, because after that it gets quite difficult. So let's begin now with some kind of definition for ionization energy. One, one quick thing is that this might be revision for HL students depending on the, the order in which your teacher is moving. So we begin with some definitions. We can define ionization energy broadly speaking, that's not just first ionization energy but any ionization energy, as the minimum energy required to remove an electron from a gaseous atom in order to form a gaseous ion. What does that mean? Let's look at an example. Here we have a hydrogen atom, and it's gaseous. How do we know it's gaseous? Because it's only one. If you have an isolated atom, it must be a gas. For it to be a liquid or a solid, it needs to have buddies to hang out with. So this, we have a gaseous hydrogen atom. We have one proton and one electron. If we add a certain amount of energy to it, either in the form of heat or light or anything, we can dislodge that electron, and in the process, we form what here? A positive ion, and we have a free electron that can go to wherever it wants to hang out. This is sort of analogous to being able to dislodge a rocket ship from the pole of our planet. So you need a certain amount of energy in order to send it out of the planet's sort of uh, pull, that, that gravitational pull. Here we need some energy, the ionization energy, to send this electron out of the pole of that proton. And so that is, generally speaking, what ionization energy is. More formally, we can write an equation for ionization energy here. So here we have a hydrogen gaseous atom giving you a hydrogen uh, cation there plus a free electron. And we can write that the delta H, which is the change in enthalpy of this equation, is indeed the ionization energy for that equation. In this case, that value is 1313 kilojoules per mole. So in order to dislodge a mole of electrons from a mole of uh, hydrogen gaseous atoms, we need 1313 kilojoules. So this definition we have here is the definition for just one electron, the amount of energy needed to remove an electron from a gaseous atom to form a gaseous ion. We could also define this per mole, so it can be defined per mole. So we could say the amount of energy needed to remove a mole of electrons from a mole of gaseous atoms in order to form a mole of gaseous ions. A mole is just 602, I think, hexillion, right? You should know this by now. So that's how we define the, the, the general ionization energy. Let's think now about first ionization energy. So for atoms with multiple electrons, we can test how difficult it is to remove each successive electron. For example, we look here at aluminum, or aluminum if you like, and we can, we can imagine that this is the first electron. It takes a certain amount of energy to remove it to create this Al positive ion here. And then we can then try to remove another electron, say this one, and that would create, uh, uh, require some other amount of energy, which here we call ionization energy 2 or second ionization energy, to form there the Al2 plus ion. And here are the the equations for that. So here we have a neutral aluminum going to aluminum positive, and there we have aluminum positive going to aluminum two positive. So we can test how easy it is to remove each successive electron. Based on this now, you should be able to deduce what do we mean by first ionization energy. 
We define it then as the minimum energy required to remove. Here's the, the difference between these two definitions. Here we have the most loosely held electron. Ionization energy is just, oh, any electron. First ionization energy is the most loosely held electron, which is usually the electron that's most outside of the atom. Okay, And here we also have to remove it from a neutral gaseous atom, because if you haven't removed any electrons yet, it must still be neutral. So that's what's first ionization energy versus just regular ionization energy. And to clarify here, for hydrogen, this of course is indeed its first ionization energy because hydrogen only has one electron. So this is actually indeed IE1 for hydrogen. But ionization energy is a general definition. First ionization energy is the first, the, the energy to remove the first electron. Okay, that was a long slide. Now I think we understand this. I can define the first ionization energy. We're, we're at an orange light with it. Let's see if we can get to green light by answering some questions. Here's the first question for you. Which of the following is the correct equation for the first ionization energy of magnesium? Pause the video and see if you can try this one. In a few seconds, I'll show you a clue. One, two, three. Here's your clue. This is not magnesium, obviously. In a few seconds, I'll show you the answer. One, two, three. There's our answer. So let's see if we can do elimination. So A, we have magnesium, positive ion becoming Mg2+. Plus. That is the second ionization energy because we've already removed one electron. So obviously it's not that one. Why isn't it C? Well, because C, we're gaining an electron. That's something different. That's electron affinity. So that's off. D, we're also gaining an electron. And it's a solid atom. So this is off for two reasons. So leaving us just with this one. Here we lose an electron to form a singly positive magnesium ion. And that's the first ionization energy of magnesium. Let's look at another question. Which of these is not an appropriate unit for ionization energy. Again, pause the video and think about this one. In a few seconds, I'll show you a clue. One, two, and a three, and a clue. Here's our clue. It's not a direct clue, it's kind of a... In a few seconds, I'll show you the answer. Now, one, two, three, here's our answer. The answer is B, All right? So joules per mole, yes, that could work. Ionization energy is an amount of energy, so joules or kilojoules could work, right? So joules, joules and kilojoules work. And also, we could define that the joules or kilojoules per mole of electrons or per mole of atoms, like I discussed in the first slide. So this would work. You could also have kilojoules per mole, okay? But uh, kilograms per mole makes no sense in the context of describing energy. So now I think we have a green light if you got those questions right for uh, defining ionization energy and understanding its equation. Let's move now to understanding the trends in first IE down groups and across periods. But before we do that, let's take a quick uh, detour. This is an extension, so you, don't, you won't be held responsible for this on the exam. But I want to tell you quickly, give you a conceptual sense of how we might go about measuring these ionization energies for atoms. We would get a certain, some kind of chamber, and we'd have the gas molecule, so you'd need to heat up alumin, alumin, <laughs> aluminum <laughs> very hot in this case, in order to create these gaseous molecules. And what we could do is, this is just one way of doing it, we would expose these atoms to uh, light whose frequency we could measure, okay? And what we do then is that we raise the energy or the frequency of this light. As you know, energy is directly proportional to frequency. We raise the energy slash frequency of that light until we're able to dislodge a bunch of electrons. And when we detect that, oh, it seems like a lot of electrons left, we, we record that point as the amount of energy required to remove that first set of electrons. Okay, so the outermost electrons in these millions of atoms have just left at that given energy. And we record that then as the first ionization energy. And we raise the energy again until we're able to dislodge another set of electrons. And we record that as the second ionization energy, and so on and so forth. Now, we've done this for aluminium, but we can repeat this process for many elements and deduce some kind of trends. For example, here, we could put a bunch of lithium gaseous atoms in this chamber and test its first ionization energies, or the second or the third, but usually we're going to focus on the first here. We could test the first for lithium and then for beryllium and boron and so on and observe the trends. Specifically, does it get harder to remove the first electron 
That is, does IE1 increase across the period? That's the question we're going to be trying to answer. In order to answer this, we're going to need to look at not just the main levels, but also the sublevels for these atoms, for these electrons. All right, so remember that this is kind of a, a simplified picture of how electrons behave or how they're arranged around atoms. We know they're really arranged in orbitals, and we can describe those orbitals or represent those orbitals using these squares. If you've forgotten that, please go and watch the video, the relevant videos. Maybe I'll link them below. Okay, so we need to look at these sublevel diagrams in order to understand the picture that I'm going to show you. But first of all, just think about it. What should we expect? Should it get easier or harder to remove the first electron as we go across a period? What would be your guess? Well, you should be thinking it should get harder, right? Because we're increasing the nuclear charge. We go here from 3 to 4 to 5. And therefore, these electrons should be pulled more closely and therefore harder to to uh, release, to, to pull off. Let's see if that prediction holds. So here we put some arbitrary point for lithium. This is how much energy it takes to pull out lithium's most loosely held electron, which will probably be that one. And then beryllium is harder. Okay, good. Boron is easier to remove that electron. Interesting. How about carbon? Harder. Nitrogen? Harder. Oxygen? Easier. Fluorine? Harder. Neon? Harder. So we do have that general trend, but there seem to be two discontinuities. We seem to have this kind of, uh, sometimes it's called a shark tooth pattern. I don't know if it really looks like a shark, like shark teeth. Okay, so here are the trends. We have an overall upward trend. And then separately, we have these two discontinuities between beryllium and boron and nitrogen and oxygen. How do we explain them? For the overall upward trend, it's just like we said, the nuclear charge is growing. So the first electron is held more tightly, or the most loosely held electron is held more tightly. Okay? And secondly, relatedly, the radius is decreasing. So as we go across a period, hopefully you remember this, the, the atoms are getting smaller because these are getting added to the same shell. Okay? But the nuclear charge is increasing, so they come in closer. Because they're closer, they're harder to pull off. How about these discontinuities? Well, between beryllium and boron, what's happening here is that the most loosely held electron in boron is in 2p. And that's higher energy than 2s. Higher energy means less stable. So here we have the valence shells for beryllium versus boron. We can see for boron, we have an electron there that is in a 2p orbital, this blue guy here. Whereas here we just have 2s. And as you can see, 2p is slightly higher energy than 2s. Higher energy means easier to remove. You can think of if a, uh, if a plane is already kind of flying in orbit around the planet, then it's easier to kind of flick it off because it's higher energy already, as opposed to a plane that is on, or let's not think of a plane, let's think of a rocket ship. It's easier to send a rocket ship from the orbit of our planet out to space than it is to send it from the ground zero out to space, right? So higher energy, easier to kick out and remove, okay? Here is a simple structure for, uh, for beryllium here. We have two electrons in this 1s orbital and two electrons in the uh, 2s orbital. And for boron, we have a similar situation, but now we have this 2p there. And for some quantum mechanical reason, this 2p here is slightly higher energy than the 2s. And so that blue electron there is gonna be easier to flick off. If you want, an analogy, another analogy, <laughs> here this is beryllium with two s electrons. The two s electrons are like tortoises, but boron also has that high energy, uh, let's call that person a child, higher energy, less stable child, that's the 2p electron. We can think tortoises are s and p's are people, so people are easier to remove than the tortoises. Now hopefully that's a <laughs> not too stupid an analogy. Now between nitrogen and oxygen, What's going on there? Well, here for oxygen, well, let's read it first. It says, the most loosely held electron in oxygen is in a paired orbital. Paired orbital. And it experiences repulsion from the other electron in that orbital, which makes it easier to remove than electrons in singly occupied orbitals. So when electrons are in singly occupied orbitals like this, okay, you remember it's because of Hund's rule that we, we arrange the electrons like this. 
When they're singly occupied orbitals, they're easier to remove because, sorry, they're harder to remove because they're not fighting against each other. These two are fighting against each other and therefore it's easier to kind of flick one out of that orbital. Here's a picture now we have this for nitrogen and we can see that we have a single electron in the 2px, single electron in 2py and single electron in 2pz. When we move over to oxygen, in the 2px now we have two electrons, okay? And so they're higher energy because they're experiencing repulsion against each other, which means it's easier to remove one of them. So now I'd say, although it looks like <laughs> something happened wrong with, went wrong with this slide, but what I wanted to point out now is that we have explained this, the period trend, but we haven't fully explained the, uh, the group trend. So let's talk now about the group trend, or rather let's do some questions on the period trend and then we'll, we'll jump to the group trend. So here's a question on the period trend. This would be a paper two question. It says, the diagram shows the trend in first ionization energies across period three. Give a reason for the overall upward trend, the discontinuity at magnesium to aluminum, and the discontinuity at phosphorus to sulfur. So pause the video, think how you would answer this. This is basically just everything we've been explaining. All right, here's how I would answer it. No need to, actually maybe it might be helpful for you to draw this stuff here. So draw the stuff that I have highlighted there in the red boxes. I'm not gonna read through this in the interest of time because this is just what we've been saying. But if you want, you can pause the video, read through it. And if you want, you can take notes. So that's how I would answer that paper two question. Here's a paper one question. The diagram shows the first ionization energies of five consecutive elements in period three. Which element is silicon? Pause and think how you would do this one. It's a bit tricky, this one. But, but, but think about what, what, what they're asking. Here's a clue. So this, this we've seen before, right? Does it make sense now what they're asking? What they're asking basically is, well, I'll give you the answer. <laughs> the answer is B. Okay, so B is silicon. What they're asking is, for, for, at what point in the, the, uh, the period three trend for ionization energy, do we have two consecutive rises followed by a drop in terms of ionization energy? And you should know that that is, that is when we go from aluminum to silicon, and then from to silicon, silicon to phosphorus, and phosphorus down to sulfur. So we have two drops, right? Two times when it gets, gets easier. That is from group two to 13 here, and then group 15 to 16 there, right? And we remember the reasons for those drops and therefore this must be this one right because for this drop here magnesium to aluminium we don't have two prior rises we only have one rise before the drop okay it's a bit of a tricky question but I've seen a question like this before in the exam so if you don't get it maybe post a comment and I will try to address that okay so now that's done we understand the period trend Again, something got messed up on this slide. Ignore this thing. <laughs> now let's look at the group trend. The group trend is very simple and uh, more intuitive. My mic is going crazy uh, than the, the period trend. So here's the group trend is that ionization energy decreases down the group. As you can see from these numbers, it gets easier to remove the outermost electron. Why? Well, because new shells are higher energy and therefore further from the nucleus and easier to remove. This guy here is gonna be easier than that guy because he's further away from the nucleus. Okay, and this is easier than that, and that's easier than that to pull off, okay? And there's one sort of contradictory thing or surprising thing, which is the nuclear charge is increasing. So here we go from one to three to 11 to 19. And as nuclear charge is increasing, for, for this trend here, we had said, as nuclear charge increases, it gets harder to pull out the electrons. Here you could say, well, as nuclear charge increases, it should also get harder to pull out the electrons. But remember that, say, this electron here is not exposed to the entire 19 plus nuclear charge. Why? Because he's shielded by all these electrons in here. So he's actually effectively exposed to only a one plus charge, one plus charge, because of that shielding. Okay. And here, just like I said, I said, although the nuclear charge increases, new shells are shielded from this charge by electrons below. So that is our decrease down group trend. Here's a question on the decrease down group trend. Which of the following would have the highest ionization energy? Pause the video as always and think about this one. One, two, three. 
there's a clue. One, two, three, there's your answer, A. Okay, so the, 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 the ionization energy should decrease as we go down the period because the electrons are getting further and further away from the nuclei and therefore easier and easier to remove. So helium should have the highest ionization energy there, okay? Now, if we put the group trend and the period trend together, then we get a diagram like this, which we've already seen, right? So we know that there's a decrease down the group and there's an increase with discontinuities across the period. The discontinuities are two to 13 and 15 to 16. And we gave the reasons for those trends down there. If you want, you can pause and read it. Here's a different representation of that diagram. Now we include all of the elements of the periodic table. Well, not really all of them, most of them, okay? And we have it in 3D. And you can generally see the trend, but we also notice a few discontinuities like we saw. The main, trend, the main trends we observed is that there's a decrease down the group. So it gets easier to remove electrons down the group, both at this side and over there at the non-metal side. And it gets harder to move electrons across the period, right? So there we see our clear trends. This data is in your data booklet. So at the top left of this cell, of the cells on um, section eight, you have the first ionization energy of each of the elements. An important thing is that the one for hydrogen is actually uh, wrong. So don't let that one confuse you. I think they're off by a decimal place or something. Okay, so now I think we are done with being able to identify and explain the trends in first ionization energy down groups and across periods. And you might need to do a bit more practice on this one, and I will leave you to do that. In the meantime, I bid you farewell and uh, happy practicing. Bye-bye.